gonna it's gonna so welcome welcome everybody my name is Bruna Santos I'm one of the co-coordinators of of the policy network on internet fragmentation have been sharing some of the efforts with Shitao Kumar and Wim for the past year almost year and a half um, on these efforts so very happy to be welcoming everybody to the first webinar of this year. The idea for today is to discuss um, internet governance and coordination. As you guys um, remember, it was one of the, the what were called baskets from our framework, from, from the PNIF um, framework, which we will explain a little bit later. But um, just to flag that um, we're gonna have some speakers today as well, kicking off the discussions we invited um, Wolfgang klein Vista, um, Anhet, Anhet um, Raquel, Gato, and Susan S., um, all to join us in this discussion. But from what I hear, Anhet is having a little bit of a connection issue. So fingers crossed um, she'll be able to join as well. Um, and I guess um, in, just in terms of like housekeeping rules and everything else, what we thought for this webinar was to have the speakers as kind of like the I don't know, the starters of this discussion, we are going to divide the debate into two blocks. One um, discussing things related to unpacking the, the concept and also prioritizations. And the second block would be um, discussions regarding addressing the issues identified um, by the speakers. In, in both of the blocks, we're going to invite um, people to join the discussion as well. So keep your questions open, keep your points and interventions already because the idea is for it to be as um, participative as possible. Wim, can I can I hand you the floor as well to just to give us a little bit explain a few a brief explanation on the on the framework and how did we arrive in, at today's um, discussions? Thank you, and uh, of course happy to do so. And let me briefly introduce. I'm Wim Dagsel. I'm uh, as a consultant uh, supporting the work of this policy network on internet fragmentation on behalf of the uh, IGF Secretariat. Uh, the same role I uh, had last year. So let me briefly, very short, uh, give the overview of uh, what we did of the policy network itself and what we did last year. Policy networks are one of the intersessional activities of the IGF. Uh, that means that they work and, and try to convene people in between IGF meetings and IGF sessions to work on um, internet policy uh, issues. Uh, specifically, the Policy Network on Internet Fragmentation is uh, was founded to further discuss and, and look into the issue of fragmentation, uh, raise awareness of its, uh, of its impacts or even of its uh, uh, existence, and work proposed towards uh, actions that risk uh, that pose a risk to the open, interconnected, and interoperable internet. The objectives um, of the PMF that already started last year uh, was to offer a systematic and comprehensive framework uh, to define internet fragmentation, then collect and analyze case studies to fine tune and complement this framework, uh, to then move or at least start the discussion, but maybe uh, or hopefully even more than just starting the discussion on uh, shared principles, recommendations of or codes of conduct that can help to prevent fragmentation and preserve that open, interconnected and interoperable uh, internet. So last year, we, uh, with the policy network, we organized a couple of uh, work uh, webinars in a similar way as the one uh, today, where we try to uh, have a number of uh, discussions introducing the topic, uh, but with the large or at least half of the, the meeting, uh, trying to involve and listen to the, um, uh, the participants and their views uh, to come up with uh, or to start building on our framework uh, to discuss fragmentation. Uh, because early on, very early on last year, we tried to uh, first come up with the definition. Uh, everyone would agree on or the shared definitions, but uh, early on, uh, it became clear that that was something uh, probably utopic uh, 
and so we tried and we uh, decided to work the other way around. Listen, what ideas exist within the um, uh, within the community, and then based on that, try to um, come up with. Uh, I like to use the the term baskets. Try to uh, form three baskets, different baskets of uh, what people see and what people understand on uh, when you ask question or talk about internet fragmentation. So the three baskets uh, we came up with is a fragmentation of the user experience, peer experience, sorry, fragmentation of internet governance and coordination, and then fragmentation of the internet's technical layer. Uh, there were further developed in, um, or more than detailed described in the uh, output document of last year. Uh, but I don't explicitly don't want to um, mention uh, that here because it is part of, the dis uh, of today's discussions to further dive into uh, what they actually mean and try to refine uh, the framework itself. So that is the three baskets of the framework, the three elements that are interconnected to each other. You can see they are not uh, different islands. And also they are all not in a, in a vacuum, but uh, are influenced by technical, political, and uh, commercial developments that are going on. So to go back to the, uh, the title itself and the, uh, the beginning, the overall goal of the framework, we always stress or, or keep adding the word discussing it's a framework to discuss fragmentation it is really to serve as a tool and a guiding and orienting tool uh, to continue the dialogue and the discussion uh, a way to um, bring more people and stakeholders in and allow at the same time a more holistic and inclusive debate um, the framework itself helps to create um, helps to create a space uh, for focused discussion and work towards concrete solutions and policy approaches and guidelines. So that's the uh, overall framework. As said, today, uh, we, or with those uh, three webinars, we try to dive or want to dive and further refine the three elements of the three baskets of our framework. And today we are discussing internet governance and coordination. And then I'm happy to hand it over uh, back to Bruna to start the discussion on the uh, topics of today. Thanks, Wim. And I just posted on the chat as well um, last year's output, um, the output from the 2022 work where we unpack a little bit um, of those questions and a short explanation on what we considered um, based on the debates um, that are like fitting into each of the, the baskets from these discussions. And just to add as well that I, I, I'm also very happy that we're starting with this discussion on, on coordination and internet governance because it does touch upon a lot of the debates we're having both at the um, working group strategy and also all the, all the other parts of the broader um, internet governance community about whether the multi-stakeholder model is changing, whether the commitments we all um, have made with this model of participation have been challenged by anything, or how can we uphold um, all of these commitments from a global perspective and, and through all um, for all stakeholders. And I guess um, the deb recent debates on the Global Digital Compact, they do shine a light on some of these um, questions as well. But as Wynne mentioned, um, we are doing two blocks of um, questions today. The first one will address um, both question one and two. So question one will be um, surrounding unpacking this concept. Um, we're, mostly, we're mostly wondering to ask um, our speakers, what is the fragmentation of internet governance and co coordination and, and what should not be considered as part of this broader fragmentation? And the second question is um, about prioritization. Um, so being that the question being um, what manifestations pose the highest risk and should be avoided um, or addressed when discussing um, internet governance and coordination. As we mentioned before, um, our speakers for today will be Susan Ness, Raquel Gato, and Wolfgang klein -Vista. So I we didn't set an order, but I would like to ask um, Susan, Wolfgang, or Raquel, does any of you want to start? Um, does any of you feel more, more comfortable starting? Just flag it or raise your hand. 
and I'll hand the floor. Okay, if nobody's going to do it, <clears throat> I'm happy to do that. Uh, just uh, for those, um, many of you, um, I've never had the pleasure of working with. Uh, I'm Susan Ness. I'm affiliated with the Annenberg Public Policy Center at the University of Pennsylvania. And I'm heading a project uh, <clears throat> together um, uh, with uh, uh, Chris Riley to what we call modularity, to introduce the notion of having piece parts uh, that are common across borders that can help us to avoid fragmentation. So I'll go back now and um, in terms of the first question about uh, fragmentation and coordination, what it is. For me, given my focus, uh, uh, fragmentation is caused by the flood of states that are introducing and enacting their own laws on governance uh, without really working uh, across borders to find common systems, common uh, definitions, common operating pieces, operational pieces, so that you end up having uh, systems whereby uh, the actual structure of um, uh, of, um, of platforms and how they are built end up having to be different because of regulations that are being imposed uh, that may be very similar, uh, but yet require different construct, different ways of approaching things. So what um, I see as one of the, the issues of fragmentation is having a lot right now collectively, we have probably, a, uh, I think there was a report at one point that said uh, 40 countries were setting up their own uh, regulatory um, laws with respect to uh, internet governance. And that's where I see some fragmentation. I'll, I'll leave it there. Thank you so much, Susan. Um, Hakel, can I can I hand the same question to you as well? Of course, and thank you so much, uh, Bruna, Wim, and, and Chipao for uh, making this effort for this webinar and this conversation. Uh, now I see Wolfgang, uh, he probably also wants to jump in. Uh, I'm sorry, we're I'm just starting. <laughs> you, you are just on time, we're just starting, and Susan just uh, briefly, gave her answer for the first question. Um, so, and, and apologies for, for the background noise. I was kept in the airport uh, and I, I, I have a duty-free selling very good subwoofers here. So anyway, I, I'm so sorry for the background noise. Um, so for the first question, I just want to take us uh, one step back and then I'm going to answer the question itself. Uh, I, I, I wanna bring us back uh, to why some of us call the internet governance ecosystem. Why do we choose to call an ecosystem, borrowing from the biology classes, if you remember this interconnected uh, organisms uh, into, you know, uh, into the physical layer? Because this idea translated uh, to us, right, the internet word, the Silicon Valley uh, language, is precisely this idea that you have a complex network, you have this interconnected uh, bodies that not only work together in terms of coordination, but that also work together in terms of collaboration. So those are pretty strong words because you, you talk about coordination more uh, uh, when we talk about the infrastructure, right? You need to make sure that uh, one body knows what the other body is doing and how uh, their um, their work is going to impact the other. Um, let's say if the IETF is issuing um, a, a new a standard, a new protocol, um, it needs to be you know, realistic with what is happening at ICANN, at the IRRs, the, the, the regional registries and so on. So that's a pretty silly example, but anyway, just to make sure that those pieces are coming together and they are working in coordination. But you also talk about collaboration. And collaboration is really this idea that is also voluntary, right? In terms of the approach, uh, but it's how you adapt 
um, you are not necessarily into a mandate that overlaps one another, but it, you really need to bring forces together. So that's um, a, a pretty good concept that I, I, I wanted to bring when we talk about, you know, uh, uh, the risks of fragmentation, when we talk about prioritizing fragmentations, I, I, I like to bring this a step back. So we remember that we are talking about this li living uh, organism, interconnected organisms, that is the ecosystem. And if one piece is lacking, you might harm the, 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 the overall flow uh, within the internet governance. So that's the first thing. The second one is, um, so uh, I, I like the approach that you were taking in terms of three um, streams. So you have the user, the infrastructure, and then the governance. But of course, we know that whatever happens in the govern in the, the the infrastructure, for example, impacts the the governance. Uh, and pretty much the, the internet governance mechanisms were built uh, in the infrastructure uh, way of uh, of networking. So um, one of the points that I want to tackle is this key characteristic of the internet to be decentralized does not mean it is fragmented. So we need also to, um, and that's why I like when you guys separate, because one thing is to have this multiple powers um, in terms of decentralized and resilience of the network uh, of the internet. And then the other point is the political fragmentation that we are talking about when we, we speak in the internet governance layer. And then in terms of what it is and what it isn't, just to go straightforward for the question, uh, I like um, the, the concept that we brought into Net Mundial in terms of uh, what is uh, a unified and unfragmented space. And I'm just going to read pretty quickly, uh, we can put in the chat later, but internet should continue to be a globally coherent, interconnected, stable, unfragmented, scalable, and accessible network of networks based on a common set of unique identifiers and that allows data packages, information to flow freely end to end regardless of their lawful content. And with that, block one, I resume. Thank you very much. Thanks, Hakel. Um, and thanks for joining us from the airport as well. We know it's a rather busy week um, here in, in the craziness of Brazilian political scenarios. So very nice to have you on board. Um, Wolfgang, I'm going to hand the floor to you as well and, and with the same questions about um, unpacking and starting to address um, this broader issue of fragmentation and where this merges with internet governance and coordination of processes. Please go ahead. Thank you very much. I um, I would um, nearly everything support what Rachel just has uh, outlined. Uh, and I think the um, language of the internet governance ecosystem, even it was borrowed you know, from another field, is uh, um, very relevant, and it uh, in, in, indeed, as Raquel has said, um, you know, everything in the internet, everything is connected with everything. That means if you do something uh, in a special area, this has consequences, very often unintended consequences for other networks. So, and that means you need a holistic approach. Uh, Bill and I have breached for the holistic approach since uh, 15 years. Uh, and uh, so that means that we have to see that as a huge system. I have compared it sometimes with the rainforest, where you have also, you know, independent system within one big system. So that means the animals in the rainforest uh, constitute a separate uh, a system of its own, but it's part of a bigger system. So, and this is, um, I think, important to, to, to get the right approach for the issue of fragmentation, because the internet, as we know from since 1969, is a network of networks. It, it is fragmented by nature. So that means because it has many, many different parts and many subsystems, and a lot of subsystems are regulated by their own uh, regulation. So uh, you can see the, the IP address system is, is regulated by different rules than the domain name system. And the internet protocols is also a system in its own. And all this together constitute what we call uh, the, the, the critical internet resources or the, the technical infrastructure, which has a certain, certain mechanism. So uh, we have to have this, um, I think that's my first point. We have to have this 
holistic approach and to accept that the, the, the whole system, which we call the internet governance ecosystem, is constituted by an endless number of subsystems with their own rules. And um, it's inter, inter, it's inter interest of, um, let's say, the um, of all participants to be part of the system. Because as we know from the Metcalf law, that the value of a network uh, uh, grows exceptionally with the number of its users. That means if you have a network with um, 5 billion, this is more valuable than a network with 5 million. So, and in so far, uh, the, to, to, to continue to enable uh, the access and participation of everybody to one this single network is uh, in the interest of every, everybody. But certainly it could be also interest of smaller groups that they say, no, we are satisfied with just a smaller network. And then they are able to constitute their own network. And then they do not have the value and the benefit from the bigger network. That's why, you know, if the Russians have decided uh, by accepting a law, they, we want to become disconnected from the internet, you know, that's possible. In my eyes, this is not basically the fragmentation of the internet because it, it does not affect the, 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 the uh, ability to communicate across borders by using the same protocols. If it comes to the governance, what uh, um, uh, Raquel said, um, she said, you know, we have the infrastructure and then we have the governance. I think if we understand the internet as a layered system, then you have governance on each of the layers. So it's not infrastructure versus governance. So you have governance of the infrastructure and you have governance of the application. I still, I uh, think that uh, the outcome from the discussion we had uh, nearly 20 years ago in the WIGIC, uh, Bill uh, was a member of it, um, where we discussed it at length and we concluded that we have to have these two layers, the development of the internet, that's more or less the technical layer, and the use of the internet, it's the political layer. And here we have to live with a, a certain contradiction because uh, the uh, on the transport layer, we have this uh, philosophy of one world, one internet. But on the application layer, uh, it, it's a dream and it's an illusion to expect that we will have the one world, one internet also on the application layer in, 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 in a world which 193 national uh, uh, nation states, sovereignties and jurisdictions. So, and, but the two layers are interlinked. And I think this is the problem. And uh, while it's an illusion that the one world, one internet philosophy from the transport layer will, uh, let's say, uh, spill over to the application layer, the danger now is that the one world, 193 national jurisdiction will split over to the transport layer. And this is the risk of the fragmentation. So that means with all the the dangers we see now on the geopolitical battle, uh, this is mainly on the on the application layer. It's about content of information. It's about human rights. It's about cybersecurity. All this is related to the use of the internet. But a lot of people understand that they can put for their interests if they go to the transport layer. And I think this is, in, in, in my eyes, the biggest uh, threat at the moment that there are ideas, you know, really to split the route, to have alternative uh, naming and numbering systems, and, you know, to disable the opportunity that everybody can uh, communicate with everybody everywhere, anytime, regardless of frontiers. Thank you. Thank you so much, Wolfgang, and to the other speakers as well. I think you, you both helped us um, summarize or spoke in different ways about, like, one of the things that are present in our output, like because in at the, the very beginning of this um, PNIF discussions, we knew in a rather clear way that we wanted to somehow address technical, legislative, and policy like developments that present challenges to to the state of the internet nowadays, and and how how to avoid um, getting into those siloed parts. And and as 
um, Wolfgang highlighted, it, it's much easier, it could be easier to speak about this from in, in different layers instead of others. And I think like um, all the recent um, attempts of regulating platforms, social media platforms and, and messaging apps have can be a really good example on how this um, the challenges can be different and, and like represent a lot more fighting in the different spaces um, within the internet. But th this, in, in a lot of ways, you, you, the three of you helped us highlight um, some of the things we were aiming to discuss. So thank you all for that. Um, this is a moment where we meant to open for um, members of the audience as well. So if anyone wants to add um, points and questions, I've seen a really good discussion on the, on the chat as well. So I'm just gonna open the, the floor again if anyone wants to jump in. Please, Ross, go ahead. Thanks very much, Bruna, and some really fascinating comments from the speakers. Um, lots of food for thought. Um, just some original um, uh, first observations that sprang to mind um, from that. I thought um, the description um, of the internet, sort of an ecosystem, was um, really, really interesting. And yes, as the speakers noted, it's important to work in uh, coordination as per the metaphor used. Um, but it's also important to note that introducing bodies or initiatives without exploring the consequences can also as such disrupt the ecosystem. Um, so we need to be cautious with um, proceeding with the introduction of new bodies, for example, um, which could unintentionally result in a fragmentation in the landscape. So there's a question to be asked around, could better coordination initiatives be achieved through channels being established but, uh, between existing bodies rather than proliferating the landscape further? Um, that's a question for thought. Um, we want a global free and open internet. And um, something to ask ourselves is whether um, a new body or initiative is contributing to this or creating, um, whether intentionally or unintentionally, a gated community, perhaps a new body established where is established, but not all stakeholders are as included. This would create issues for a free global and open in the internet. So we need to think really carefully um, about that. Um, it's critical that all, all stakeholders in that regard, not just government are part of governance initiatives and bodies. Um, and in this regard, inclusivity, transparency, and accessibility is essential is an essential part um, of this. And um, finally, just to note um, uh, in that regard as well, the potential second and third order effects of, or the longer term effect of decisions to create new bodies uh, down the road uh, should be considered in that regard well. But, as well, particularly the point around making um, them in, um, uh, fully integrative of all stakeholders. Thanks very much. Thanks, Ross. And, and I do think you bring on such a relevant question about the processes as well. And mostly a concern that has been in all of our minds when addressing how the GDC can contribute to the broader processes and how should we um, be improving the conversation between the stages and and the actors as well, and, and in order to like enhance participation in the end of the day. Um, Bill, I see you have your hand up as well, so I'll give you the floor. Sure, okay. Um, hi, everyone. Uh, first, I would second what Rosalind said. I, I was a little about uh, new bodies. I was a little concerned that, um, you know, if you've been paying attention to the GDC discussions, uh, there just seems to be a desire among some in the UN bureaucracy to have some new thing that they can hold up and say, look what we built. Um, and um, it's not clear to me that that's gonna be very helpful. Um, and when people cycle into the process who weren't here 15, 20 years ago uh, and propose things that were hugely problematic 15, 20 years ago, it's kind of surprising. Oh my God, we're going to have enhanced cooperation again. Let's spend another five years shouting at each other. Uh, so hopefully that doesn't happen. Um, I I, uh, I just had a question because I'm I'm sorry. I you know I 
cycle in and out of this myself. I um, after the um, after the IGF, I haven't been too uh, attuned to uh, what's happening in PNF because of teaching and things like that. So the 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 revised framework now uh, has this um, layer of fragmentation uh, in governance and coordination, and that doesn't fit with my own personal intellectual topography of this space, but that's fine. It doesn't have to. Um, I, you, I mean, those of you who read the thing uh, did for WEF in 2015 know how where how I do this, but um, but could somebody explain to me a little bit more? Just I, I want to understand how is um, how are differences among institutional venues for policy discussions an example of internet fragmentation? Because I just don't there's I, I I don't understand. I mean, it's, it's often said, and this makes me crazy. In Washington D.C., for example, the Council on Foreign Relations had this uh, report um, where where they said that because of the fragmentation, U.S. foreign policy should be focused on sort of great power competition and forget the open internet that was a failure. And that makes me insane because I, the, the things that they point to as reasons for why that should be so are simply that different governments have different policies. Different governments have always had different policies. I don't think differences in policy are fragmentation unless they cause internet fragmentation. So if you are, if you are, you if you have government policies that uh, break the ability of, of uh, willing participants to exchange packets and break the ability of the internet to interoperate uh, consistently across global spaces, okay, that's fragmentation. But the fact that Britain and France and the US have slightly different policies about X, or the fact that the ITU is over here doing this and UNESCO is over there doing that and ICANN's over there doing that, that to me is not fragmentation. So I don't really understand what the IG coordination fragmentation dimension is. And so if those of you who did that could explain that to me. I'd just, I'd understand what's happening more. Thank you. Thanks, Bill. And um, Chital, do you want to jump in on that one? Um, sure, yeah, thanks for that. And this is a great discussion so far. I think, um, Last year, when we were discussing uh, the different elements of fragmentation, um, Bill, but also others who were there can, can come in. It was very much an exploratory discussion. And what we ended up doing was just listening and almost like skimming off the surface the most um, things that came up to the surface. And we could be really clear that they were different in what they were referring to. Um, and in the end, we came up with these, these buckets because there was enough difference between what people were referring to um, in, between these three, but similarity in the examples that allowed them to be bucketed um, according to one of the three. And in, in the um, internet governance and, and coordination bucket, well, the reason we, we have that is because, um, and, and again, you know, if, if others understood it differently, um, is that we, we heard uh, that, um, there are enough or an increasing number of, of regulatory frameworks and policies and actions and measures that are being taken, particularly by governments um, that are incompatible or that do not um, work together in a way that allows for data flows. It might not be about packets being exchanged, but again, this is an area we can discuss, right? Especially when it comes to the intersection of these different areas. Which, which in a practical sense results in, um, in, in different ecosystems and, and the interoperability um, that you know, we associate with the internet being affected in some way by regulations. In addition to the setup of competing um, um, institutions, perhaps um, at in multilateral institutions with different mandates or with similar mandates but that are competing and not working together. So there was that aspect as well. So there was this sort of proliferation of regulatory frameworks that are, do not, are not compatible or that um, do not work together. And then there's also the setting up of new institutions and bodies um, that um, may compete in their mandates or don't work together or duplicative in some way. So there was, I think that was, that was all part of the, the discussion. And, and that's 
you know, people were offering that example as well as examples of measures um, like like blocking and shutdowns or or attempts to create alternative routes. And so, you know, there was just so much in that that we then, you know, uh, created these buckets. Uh, so that's where it came from. Um, I'm very like, you know, interested to hear whether whether others have examples or think um, uh, differently about this particular area, but it is something that we are having this particular discussion about to actually dig deeper into. So what we did last year was just exploratory. And we're looking to dig into it now, but what I'm really hearing is that this, um, the, the points around the need for interoperable, e like an ecosystem to, to protect those characteristics um, of the internet governance um, uh, system is really important. So clearly there is some sense that there that is a threat in some way, perhaps. Um, thanks, Bruna, for just giving me the floor there. I hope that was helpful, Bill. And anyone else who, who was around last year contributing to the framework, please do, please do come in. Yeah, I'm and just going to add, please, mm. please finish it up, um, Shital, don't worry. Oh, thanks. I just looked at the chat and really said if different policies cause fragmentation, um, okay, but the, I don't, I think that's really important differentiation. It's not just different is bad. <laughs> it's about the impact um, of those. And um, I think that that's something that would be really interesting to, to dig into. Yeah, just um, before I give the floor to Marek, just to add that, like, nowadays we're discussing the duplication of this process, right, and, and whether the GDC poses a new um, challenge to all of us in the creation of a new space, of a new forum for these discussions, and all of the build-up there has to exist in order for people to join and participate um, at these spaces. But one of the examples that was mentioned a lot to us last year was also when um, let's say member states, they drift to less accountable and less participatory spaces and forums such as the ITU or like other spaces to discuss the same policies that are being debated by the IGF and, and, and the UN in general. And I guess um, the new IP discussions could be one example of that. And, and so th But there's obviously a lot of um, other spaces and even the cybercrime um, debates can be another example of that too. So it's kind of what we mean, what, what, what we mean with that bill. It, it's not necessarily that we're claiming that this causes fragmentation, but it's mostly kind of like a, a word of caution that um, the competition or either the duplication of those spaces can be something challenging for the creation and discussion of policies regarding um, internet governance or cooperation or um, in just in general policies. Um, Marek, I saw you have you had your hand up. So if, if in case you want to um, jump in the conversation, please go ahead. Yeah, I mean, I guess just to say I, I, I put my hand down because I agreed with what you were saying. But I think that, yeah, my, my kind of answer to that question was really just to highlight, I guess, maybe like standards bodies um, and kind of global internet governance institutions as kind of potentially um, what I would see is like the important part of this conversation around fragmentation of internet governance, um, not to say that kind of policy actions at the national level aren't kind of a, a relevant part of this, but I think that it's really about kind of that global coordination. And I think there is a relevance of kind of how national actions or regulations uh, potentially conflict with that kind of global level coordination. Um, but when you think about something like kind of competing standards bodies um, and the impact that that then has on the technology and kind of uh, the kind of protocols or, or kind of the management of the DNS, I think it's much clearer why having kind of like three competing bodies each trying to manage the global DNS, that, that really leads into technical fragmentation. And I think that's why there's that kind of like arrow between um, fragmentation of the internet governance and fragmentation at the technical level, um, but yeah. Thanks, Marek. Um, Hakel? Thank you, Bruna. And let me chime in just as a participant, right? Not as <laughs> I think we are in a conversation here uh, because I, I think uh, Bill and others raised a really important point. And for me, it's almost a myth busting when we talk about, you know, internet governance uh, fragmentation. Um, 
let me try to give uh, an example um, because I started saying centralized governance does not mean fragmented uh, governance. And, and, and let me explain why. So if, if we go to the infrastructure layer, um, and um, I, I'm not going over the seven layers. I put something in the chat that I agree with Wolfgang, and I think he has a very good visual here for the group to, to think about in the layer eight and layer nine. But in terms of the core, as we know, the internet is this network of networks, right? So you have these smaller networks, which uh, are called the, the autonomous systems, and they go into voluntary bases to adopt the, the, the standard protocols uh, for the IETF and to have this common language. So let me start with this basic view, very, very uh, basic, um, and, and in a, shut down, a nutshell. Um, they can choose, for example, uh, a, a, a smaller uh, autonomous system. Uh, they can choose to, to, you know, instead of using TCP, use PCT just to go into reverse. <laughs> and then they, they might not be connected to the internet anymore, but that's that's their choice. They're going to be a local network and they are going to run their, their roles. And, and you know, it, it's still a network among computers. Uh, it's just not the internet. Um, or that might not be connected to the internet. So that's that's one thing uh, when we talk about this the centralized view and 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 this multiple um, uh, powers right in the, the infrastructure layer. The other thing is when you have, for example, let's say um, uh, country X that really puts kind of the the blocking and the shutdown of the whole country from the internet. So. That's where I think we got more of this blurred view. Um, and I understood, for example, um, uh, Wolfgang was saying if Russia decides, you know, to to come in another local network, they can. And and, and then, of course, they can. Um, and they are not going to harm uh, the, the Internet, um, let's say, in its core, because all the rest is going still to run into TCP, the common language and the standard protocols and so on and so forth. But then you, you do miss um, one important thing, which is this retrofit between the global and the local. And that's where I, I wanted to say, for me, it's the myth busting, because we don't say that internet governance, by saying it needs to be you know, uh, open and global internet, it, it doesn't uh, want to have local um, uh, regulation or to have local rules. Uh, this capillarity is very much important for, for the internet itself and for the, the governance uh, itself. I think the, the problem is when you overpower uh, one over another, and, and, and that's the, the, the break that we are talking here. I, I hope this does make sense. Thanks, Raquel. I'm going to take on the, the, the list. So, Wolfgang, please. Yeah. Uh, thank you very much. Um, I think it's really useful to have this debate because uh, as long as we discuss internet fragmentation, we realize that's also a question of language, of understanding, of definition. So because, um, you know, a couple of years, there was a common understanding what internet fragmentation is. We have a unified internet and the risk is uh, it will become a splinter net. And but if you go really into the details what fragmentation means, then you discover <laughs> that so many meanings, meanings. And my conclusion from Addis Ababa was we had seven workshops on internet fragmentation. And uh, so at the end of the day, at the end of the IGF, I said, you know, it depends. Different people have different understanding what it is, the fragmentation of users, fragmentation of communities. Bill mentioned the fragmentation of language. So that means if the IDN is this fragmentation, some people say IP4 uh, version 4 and IP version 6 is also fragments the internet because it, it is not uh, uh, compatible in, in, in both ways. So. Probably, you know, the, the, the language we are using, internet fragmentation, at a certain moment is also confusing, and we should look for alternatives to make clearer what we have in mind, what is the, the problem, the technical and the political problem. And, you know, in the 90s, there was another language which has disappeared. It was called uh, internet balkanization. So it was, you know, people referred to the collapse of Yugoslavia, 
And then the wars among the different countries, Serbia versus Croatia and Bosnia. So, and this was called like the internet wars that we have the unified network at this was still the TCP IP and, and with the World Wide Web, it became a problem. And then you had OC and other protocols. So it was a protocol war. And at this time there was a risk that you have really <laughs> different uh, independent networks using different protocols. And you know, if you want to go from an alternative route to the what are called the, the, the Yana route, then you needed some technical things, you know, uh, probably a passport or an exit visa or an entry visa uh, to enter the other network. So, and I think this is the big risk that you, uh, and, and, and I think that's the core of the problem. Uh, the, if you disable, communication regardless of borders. So I, I think that's the point. And from a political point of view, what uh, the, um, uh, I think uh, it was uh, Eric Schmidt when he was still with Google, who introduced another uh, uh, language and, and he called it internet bifurcation. And he said, you know, it's looking between the US-China conflict and that, okay, we will see a bigger split and this will be lead to a bifurcation of the internet split into two parts, not into many fragments. And I think looking ahead in the year 2035 or 2049, when China celebrates the 100th anniversary of the People's Republic of China and want to be uh, the, 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 the leading power in the world. So uh, I think we have to have this perspective. We argue that now 5 billion users are using the DNS. So if you create an alternative to the DNS and get around three or 4 billion users, then you have really a split of the, uh, of the, uh, of the route. So, and if you bring together the, the, the population of China, of Russia, of India, of South Africa, and, and, uh, and, and Brazil, the five BRICS countries, if they come together and say, we do not like uh, ICANN at the Yana route, we create an alternative. Then you have already four or five billion users and they can use national legislation that every, every uh, citizen of this country has to use the, a BRICS route. It makes economically at this moment no sense because all the value is in the networks which are in the Western world. So it would be totally counterproductive for China and India and Brazil uh, to cut off. You know, Russia is a special case. Crazy politicians do not understand it and go a high risk, which is very negative for the people in, 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 in Russia. So uh, it's, it's, it's really a tragedy that this people are governed by such uh, crazy politicians. So, but we have to see a potential that if you create enough, a critical mass, three or four billion, then this could lead to a, to, to a split. And, and there are technical opportunities. At the moment, we have the discussion about the internet and the .eth domain and what Kurt Britz has written about Web2 and Web3 and you know how to harmonize and bring this together. The .hd domain has uh, around one or two billion, million users. The DNS are five billion. So these are two different animals. So, and it's difficult, you know, with all this blockchain. So, but it's a problem. We have to discuss this. But the, the real risk is really the, the geopolitical split and the, the consequences which come from, from this uh, uh, new world where we see the emergence of an autocratic world and a democratic world and uh, how to build bridges, how to avoid that the, the world falls apart. So that's a bigger thing. It's not a challenge for the internet community, but they can make a contribution. That's why safety on our route, make it attractive as possible. And I think it was a, an a interesting and an important political signal from ICANN not to follow the, 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 the recommendation from the Ukrainian minister. It was justified from their perspective, but to signal we are the neutral steward of a global resource. We do not take sides. We are not, you know, in one camp. We we manage that uh, on behalf of the of the global community, regardless of their political differences. I think this was an, an, a very important thing and to help 
I can allot at least for the next 10 years. Thank you. Thanks, Wolfgang. And um, yeah, just to flag that Bill, your point about um, clarifying a little bit further what we mean with this um, fragmentation of processes and so on is really well taken. I guess the idea for these webinars is not to like um, validate or legitimize any concepts um, that we try to kind of like trace out um, based on last year's work. It's mostly to see whether they make sense, whether it, it does, um, it is valid to speak about fragmentation of the process and it having um, kind of an effect on the policymaking um, spaces and so on, or whether is it valid, as you guys were saying, to talk about a good or bad um, fragmentation of the internet or fragmentation in general. So it's, it, it, I think it would be better for us to look at this kind of webinars, mostly as a test um, to the concept and ideas we're trying to like float around um, instead of um, a space for validation. So all of your points, um, both Victorio as well, and are being well taken into this debate. And, and I thank you all a lot for the intervention so far. Um, I see Alisa has her hand up. So please go ahead. Yes, thank you. Um, so for whoever doesn't know me, I'm uh, Alisa Hever from the Dutch government. Um, um, and well, obviously, well, we don't want internet fragmentation, uh, uh, just to put that clearly down here. Um, and. Uh, given the this distinction that Wolfgang made in his first intervention between regulation of the transport layer and regulation or uh, yeah and of the application layer and if you really want this final report also to be interesting for governments I, I, I really think um, it's important to showcase um, uh, different uh, types of regulation that have actually been created or almost were created um, and uh, cr created some sort of uh, fragmentation on the transport layer um, and try to ask these governments why they took these measures. Why did they feel uncomfortable with um, the multi-stakeholder model of internet governance or, or with the internet organizations taking these measures? Try to, to, to reach out and find the reasoning of these, these governments. Um, only then if we maintain in contact with these governments to, to understand what, what, what's behind it, we can also talk with them and, well, maybe press them and hmm, maybe better not take this measure or um, cycle it backwards. Um, and also have a reflection on, on, uh, on the, the, the internet organizations itself on maybe could could they have taken some type, sort of more responsibility or uh, actions in keeping, for example, the DNS uh, clean and safe? Because I know that's something that the EU um, really feels strongly about, um, that a lot of, well, um, organizations that are, uh, are responsible actually for keeping the DNS um, clean and safe and I know that might not be specifically the transport layer anymore everywhere um, but I do think that that that's part of the reason why they they took some some measures um, so well if you want I think if you really want to have an interesting report for governments try to understand why some governments want to regulate and well, what we can do in to prevent them uh, from from taking these measures in 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 the in the near future. Thanks. Thanks a lot, Elisa. I'm just going to hand the floor to Susan as well. Thank you very much. Um, I think the conversation has been very useful. Certainly, uh, Wolfgang's. Uh, drawing the distinction, of course, between the technical uh, internet system uh, and um, the platform uh, application governance, very, very different. I would, um, and this goes back, I think, to Bill's comment, though, um, I would push back against that. I do see the fragmentation, that there is fragmentation when I look at it from the user perspective, does the user have access to the entire ecosystem? 
to all of the information that's available online. And if not, what is causing that? If it's caused by government regulation that prohibits, for example, um, the uh, virtual networks or blocks uh, certain applications uh, and the like, uh, or geofences in other, in other ways, that causes fragmentation. Um, so I look at it from the user perspective, uh, but I agree that's very different. Um, uh, it, it bleeds over uh, to the technical internet for sure, but um, but it also says that government regulation um, can cause uh, the ability of users and does cause the ability of users not to be able to gain access and that um, provides a different way of, of looking at it. Uh, it can be reversed. It can be reversed much more easily than uh, uh, efforts to change the technical layers um, where that's going to be much more difficult to, to reverse when governments change. But um, nonetheless, uh, from, a, from a practical perspective, from the user perspective, there, uh, if you don't have access to all of the information, that is fragmentation in my perspective. Thank you. Thanks, Susan. Um, I'm just uh, taking on from Bruna here because she's had to leave us, unfortunately, but we are going to go for another 30 minutes. Um, so please do stay with us if you can. Uh, it's been a really interesting conversation so far. I think we've touched on a lot of different points and I'll try and tease those out towards the end um, to see where we can take this conversation next, but we're not there yet. Uh, we definitely want to keep talking um, and I can see there's another hand, but also a lot in the chat. Um, and as we are entering the last 30 minutes, encouraging everyone to think about what's been said, but also um, think about uh, ways that you think we need to be addressing um, the challenges that have been outlined. And there are a couple of points that have been made about the proliferation of, of institutions, for example, as potentially um, actually moving us away from more open internet and or an open internet and so it perhaps the way of addressing that being a more collaboration is that sufficient or do we actually need something else you know these are some of the questions we can try and tackle we don't have to do it all here today we can have a follow-up we'll talk about that in a bit um but please do continue to offer your perspectives chris you're next Thanks, Sheetal. Um, apologies, I'm, I'm sitting outside, so I hope the wind is not too bad. Um, I also had to drop off uh, for a, a period earlier in the call, so I hope I'm not repeating um, what's already been said. Um, I, I do think there's a bit of a rabbit hole there of this whole good, good fragmentation, bad fragmentation thing. I think what is important to note, I, I think it's, it's useful to have this delineation of baskets of fragmentation. Um, governance, technical user experience. But it's also important to note the connections between those baskets. And I think when we're talking about fragmentation at the technical layer and preventing people from accessing a global network of networks, I, I think that's that's unquestionably bad. That's not something that you want that that we prioritize in looking at how to how to govern the internet. When we're talking about fragmentation at the governance layer, I think one of the reasons we're looking at that as an issue is where it would lead us down a road that takes us to technical fragmentation. So that's identifying that sort of connection between them is really important. Um, I think what I hope we're doing here and hope we're moving towards with the paper is starting to think about how can we actually prevent the kind of fragmentation that we see going on in the governance layer. And I think I absolutely don't want to under, um, underestimate the importance and the power of simply identifying this as an issue, as defining it, making it clear to governments why and others why this would be a problem. Um, I think we've seen a lot of good work in that in the responses to the Global Digital Compact, uh, where people have emphasized the need to use the existing structures, not just sort of proliferate new structures for specific tasks when we don't have a clear sense of the coordination 
that needs to exist. Um, but I think also what, what really jumped out at me uh, about Susan's work with modularity is that that's actually another very practical step that we can take towards trying to address the sort of misalignment and, uh, and, and fragmentation that happens in global policy, even when the goals that a lot of governments might have are very similar or very aligned. So this, this sort of, this kind of initiative, this kind of effort where we actually look at, okay, what are the goals? How can we align better so that global, global public policy is not having a potentially fragmentary effect at the technical layer? Um, and so I, I think that that kind of practical step is really necessary and really important in this discussion as we move beyond the, the definitional discussion. Thanks. Thanks, Chris. And I think some of that teasing out between the different aspects of the or the buckets of the framework um, is happening organically in this discussion, but it's also something we really want to continue to do because as the framework displays, we see that there are connections and it is helpful to understand what those are. So thanks for giving us some ideas in that regard. Um, Jorge, you are next. Yes, Jorge. Okay, uh, thank you. Thank you, Shital. And uh, very sorry to be chiming in uh, so late in, in this call. Uh, this is Jorge Canti from the Swiss government. But I, I thought that now that we are talking about also uh, fragmentation in the governance, we should be very uh, mindful and vigilant uh, around uh, proposals that are being suggested within the UN itself, uh, unfortunately, of people that uh, seem to ignore or despise what the IGF ecosystem has been doing for the last uh, 15 plus years is to create new structures that uh, would uh, render really the, the IGF uh, more or less meaningless by creating uh, such new structures um, uh, oriented to following up on the global digital compact, which is being uh, discussed and prepared for being adopted in 2024. And uh, obviously such structures most probably if uh, they align with uh, what uh, the process has to has been so far, uh, probably it would uh, be only multi-stakeholder multi in the name, but not in their essence. So I, I'm really cautioning all of you here, if uh, you have an esteem for the multi-stakeholder approach to, to be very vigilant on that, because this is, ongoing as we speak. Thank you. Thank you, Jorge. Um, so that's a point about um, uh, strengthening or per perhaps preserving uh, an approach, multi-stakeholder approach, um, as perhaps one of the key, key uh, elements um, that we can not, and I'm not saying now, but at some point um, could be part of this work is, is understanding how we how we could do that or um, what is happening to, to challenge that, uh, that we can try and come up with some recommendations to ensure that that, that doesn't happen or to, to support, um, uh, like you say, the, the multi-stakeholder approach. So um, a key point, I saw some support for that in the chat. Um, and now I'm going to go to, to Bill. I just wanted to echo Jorge's concern, um, although I think this is a somewhat separate question from fragmentation per se. I think it's worth reiterating anyway, because it's a, a live issue. Um, you know, I mean, it seems to me that um, the, the good news is that in the post wisis environment, a lot of intergovernmental organizations have built in greater levels of multi-stakeholder engagement in terms of the ability to provide input. So we see that in a lot of different um, IGOs that now there's some effort to be more transparent with some, some documents, et cetera. And there's more 
kind of solicitation. Sometimes it's kind of closed and only to certain people rather than completely open and bottom up, but still some solicitation of uh, stakeholder perspectives. And then that's declared to be multi-stakeholder. Um, I think it's not multi-stakeholder. I think anybody who's worked in real multi-stakeholder processes thinks of multi-stakeholder as being bottom up uh, uh, collective decision-making um, with full transparency and iterative processes and so on. But I, I would call it more sort of intergovernmental plus. But either way, how, whatever you wanna call it, it's different from certainly what's done in the I-STAR organizations, et cetera. Um, and I think that there's more and more of a dynamic these days of trying to promote that model. Um, and while it is an improvement over traditional closed intergovernmental spaces, it is it should be clear in people's minds that it's not really the same thing as multi-stakeholder and uh, that there's a certain use and abuse, use and abuse uh, strategically of the term that's happening there. So the folks that are in New York that would like to have some kind of new mechanism, um, yeah, I think that they think that the IGF was not invented by them um, and uh, doesn't yield the kinds of dynamics that make them happy and they'd like something that's more part of, and there really is, I have to say, having lived in Geneva for 21 years and then living now in New York, the differences in culture, I mean, I'm sure many of you know this, but maybe some don't. Differences in culture in New York uh, UN and Geneva UN are night and day. I mean, New York New York is much more intergovernmental. They really don't have the mindset of the kind of diverse multi-stakeholder engagement kind of stuff that a lot of the specialized agencies and, and UN bodies in Geneva have gotten used to. Um, so having stuff sort of built out of New York is inevitably going to end up meaning that stakeholder views become allowed, quote unquote, in a kind of more bounded way. And I think that's something to push back on. And uh, when I see some folks supporting that kind of approach, I feel like, wow, we're back in, in the working group at Enhanced Cooperation. And it's the same, <laughs> it's the same debate from 2007. So anyway, I just wanted to, to agree with Jorge on that. Thanks. Thanks. I think there's a lot of um, like more, you know, yeah, uh, more beneath the surface. I think, as you mentioned, Bill, when it comes to use of these terms, um, and perhaps it's something that we could look at uh, and packing a bit more to give it uh, an understanding um, that is a, a reflects the uh, bottom-up approach or certain values we'd want to see. Um, it's something that we could think about this PNIF doing. Um, I do see a couple more um, hands, so we'll go to those, and then I'd like to be um, wrapping up, if that's okay, um, and thinking about next steps with you all. Um, okay, so I see Raquel. I, I don't know if, Chris, that's an old hand, but because we've just heard from you, I hope it's okay we go to Raquel and then Roz. Raquel. Thank you very much, uh, Chital. And uh, I, I'm so sorry if I can anticipate my wrap up because I do need to go to the Supreme Court. We have hearings about content regulation, uh, talking about local <laughs> ruling anyway. So, um, but I, I, I wanted to really reiterate something I, I put in the chat or, or two points I, I, I have as a takeaway from uh, today's session. First, it was such a rich discussion, and I, I think we should uh, definitely repeat or, or expand a little more on, on this concept um, that we, we start surfacing here. But more than that, I would like to support this, um, that we, we have further discussions on the GDC impact and all this, you know, um, efforts uh, that are beyond the IGF. I don't think we can take the IGF for granted. The mandate is up here for renewal. Um, we, we can take the multi-stakeholder model for granted. Um, we've heard from Jorge, Bill, and others, um, all the risks that are coming up and the misinterpretation that is being done uh, for what is called the multi-stakeholder model. So I definitely think this is something for uh, the, the, the policy network to be, uh, to be tackling. Um, and I don't want to be the, the, the bad voice here putting things on your shoulder. I'm so sorry, but <laughs> I, I, I think it's important to to flag. 
Um, but also, uh, and uh, when I heard about um, the, the end user and, and Susan, made, Susan made such a great point, uh, but I do think also we have um, some effort to also translate these discussions uh, to really meaningful gather um, end users perspectives, because even if between us, the usual suspects, we can, you know, find an alignment, imagine that um, into the, the overall um, end users discussion. So um, I, I think we need to um, to broaden, you know, the discussions, but there are some efforts also on, on, on how to, to, to tap them. Um, and I'm so sorry, I, I will have to leave, but thank you so much again. Uh, and I will take uh, any, uh, any points that you have in the wrap up later uh, to catch up. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you, Raquel. Thanks so much for joining us in the time that you you could. I know some people do have to leave, um, but uh, thank you for being here for the time that you could be. And we will be following up, um, of course, and uh, discussing some ideas for how to take this forward. I uh, really valued um, your participation, all the points that you, you made. Um, okay, well, I can see that we have uh, one, another hand here. Um, yes, Roz, and then if anyone else wants to come in, we, we have time for perhaps one more person and, and then we will need to discuss next steps, I believe. So Roz, over to you. Thanks very much, Sheetal. And just to say what an excellent webinar and lots of food for thought here, I think definitely. But just to go back to and I, I you know, and thank Jorge really for making the comment about multi stakeholder as make multi stakeholderism as well. But just to consider a potential recommendation could be to ensure the inclusion and transparency of governance processes by including all stakeholders beyond consultation phases. Um, also supporting, for example, multi-stakeholder drafting groups, uh, as has been suggested in the GDC and other such initiatives. Um, I think that also goes back to the point I think it was Bill was making about um, some of the potential uh, difference in working methods or discrepancies between New York and um, Geneva. Um, but of course, the onus should not simply be on uh, stakeholders to contribute to these processes. For example, when they're member state led at the UN, but also for those governments to proactively create spaces and initiatives that are inclusive to all stakeholders participation as well. Um, so ensuring that these spaces are made um, inclusive um, for that multi stakeholder participation and that it's included and valued. Thank you. Thank you so much. Some really great recommendations there. And we wanted to um, spend some time on, on ideas, rec concrete recommendations to address the, the problems we had outlined. And it seems to me, although it's difficult to wrap up everything, one of the problems that there has been some agreement around is the, um, the potential threats to the uh, multi-stakeholder um, governance uh, approach and systems and and how that really needs to be preserved and strengthened and you, Ross, you gave us some some great ideas there. Um, there was also interest in taking forward more um, in-depth discussion around the the global digital compact and the surrounding um, uh, processes as well so we can take that on board. Um, I, I think in the last few minutes that we have it would be great to talk about processes, in fact, <laughs> for the, the, the policy network to take forward this work um, to ensure um, that what we have uh, outlined here, some of the common um, points that people have been making around the, um, the need to differentiate between um, the different uh, layers of the internet, but the ecosystem approach and model and the, the need for, um, for that to be, to be maintained for the multi-stakeholder approach, the concerns around um, um, policies and measures, creating impacts that could have uh, a fragmentary impact, digging a bit deeper into that, all of that, um, taking all of that uh, to another discussion, I think is what we will we will have to, to do. Um, so there, there are a couple more deep dives um, that we, we have planned. Um, 
which we will communicate to you the date and the times and um, deep dives. Sorry, what I meant was webinars. <laughs> um, talking about the compact confused me a bit there, but we have our own uh, two more webinars coming up, one on technical layer fragmentation and on user experience fragmentation. And I hope that we can weave in some of the comments that have been made here that are relevant there as well. So that we'll, we'll let you know about, but also we'll need to take this forward. So one idea is to, is to have some um, volunteers to, um, to work with us on uh, unpacking um, some of the points that have been made here, perhaps uh, fleshing out some of the recommendations um, that have been made and reaching out to, to those who have been on the call, um, to the policy network more widely, um, to work on on something, some piece of some piece of paper, really. Um, um, we see uh, digitally speaking, so that that would be a, a piece of work that would help us move forward. Um, to have perhaps a couple of volunteers for that, or um, another approach could be that we organize another one of these, a follow up, um, or we set up an, a thread on the the on the um, uh, on the group mailing list or or a separate one. So really interested to hear what you all think about taking forward this discussion um, and what you think would be would be best to do. Any thoughts? I don't know when I don't want to put you on the spot, but um, as a as one of the other <laughs> ones in our team helping. I don't know if you have any thoughts. Uh, I see there are two hands up, so it's... Oh, okay, okay, great. I was just looking at the chat and um, there's... Okay, so I will go to the hands. We have Lisa and Susan. Shall I go first, then? Yes, yes, please go ahead. Okay, sure. Um, yeah, I just wanted to flag um, that I'm, I'm hearing that this discussion sometimes tends to move towards the GDC and the WISIS plus 20 review process. Um, and for the the IGF meeting, there is at least an intention to have a main session on these two topics. And um, so I, I, as much as I find it interesting, I do think we, we should try to focus with this group on, on internet fragmentation um, and not too much delve into the, the processes that are taking place now in, 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 in New York and Geneva for for the well, and that's the future of internet governance. I, I understand it. There is some linkages, but um, uh, let's not make it too big in this group, and well, discuss that in a, in a separate group. Okay, thank you. Yes, yeah, so there is a lot um, that was discussed, and I think the compact and the WISIS and. Those processes came up as part of the, the discussion, but as you say, there was a lot more um, that we need to pick up on. So thanks for reminding of, us of that, uh, Susan. Thank you very much. Um, I know that uh, Chris Buckridge had mentioned uh, modularity as uh, something that uh, a uh, help in a positive way to avoid fragmentation. Uh, and I, uh, we really didn't explore question three today, which was what practical guidelines principles could help that. And so I just wanted to put on the table in case anyone is interested, the concept that um, um, a different Chris and I have been developing, which uh, basically is saying, okay, you have a number of different governments coming up with different laws but within each of these laws, and um, you know, they correspond obviously to different uh, government legal systems, but nonetheless, each of them trying to address very similar kinds of uh, problems um, with platforms uh, uh, online. There are common themes that, that stretch across those regulatory regimes. And those co they have common mechanisms that could be developed by multi-stakeholders. So once again, this is a multi-stakeholder bottom-up focus to develop and operate with the acceptance of the various governments. And that's what we're trying to put forward. We call it modularity because it's modular. 
you have it a very narrow uh, uh, operational, for example, system, such as vetting researchers to gain access to platform data. You don't need to have four different systems or five different systems to do that. Have one system developed by multi-stakeholders and operated with oversight by the government, uh, government, but done by the multi-stakeholders. So this is the concept that we are uh, putting forward. There are lots of other things where you could have multi-stakeholder developed common systems. It's not gonna be perfect by any stretch, but what we do want to encourage is governments to provide that hook to allow um, the acceptance of these cross-border operating systems. And I'll put in the chat a couple of articles um, that have been written about modularity to better explain what it is we're trying to do to continue to have common access um, uh, despite different uh, overarching government regulation. That would be very helpful, Susan, if you can put in some links to your work on modularity. Um, and if there are some, some um, principles or approaches there uh, that uh, speak to um, others uh, as we work through this um, and, and could be seen as useful to reflect in the output of the document, then, um, then certainly it would be really interesting, at least to begin with, to, to read your, your work and, and to discuss it. So thank you for, um, for sharing that. So um, as I said, we have, um, we have a few minutes left and we have all the plans for the other uh, webinars um, in, the, in the coming weeks, but uh, we do need to take forward this particular discussion in some way. Um, so there are a couple, there are a few different ways that we can we can do that. Um, but this was really just an exploratory one. So we will we will need to have some sort of follow up. Uh, and we can, um, if no one has any specific ideas for that, we can of, of course come back to you um, with some suggestions and and take it from from there. But I did see some support for more um, webinars and. Thank you for the, yes, thank you for that. Um, okay, Wim, did you want to add anything? Uh, there's still a hand for Bill. Oh, Bill, Please. Bill, sorry, go ahead, Bill, thank you. Thanks. <clears throat> um, uh, as Susan knows, uh, I've proposed a, um, a day zero event uh, for uh, Kyoto following up on the day zero I did last, last year, uh, which is on uh, exactly uh, modular uh, approaches in a somewhat different context, digital economy agreements, which are increasingly becoming a uh, important mechanism internationally, uh, are structured in a modular way uh, and can be leveraged, I would argue, for tackling some of the uh, problems of fragmentation. So we're going to be trying to look in concrete terms at how uh, modular institutional design can lend themselves to uh, working together on different types of issues. It's, it's different from what She's suggesting in that it's modular within a, an overarching framework rather than the a la carte thing. Um, but anyway, the, but this leads to a general point. Um, my recollection of last year was that we got a little jammed up prior to the IGF. And so uh, you know, there was you guys who were running this process had to kind of rush to pull stuff together at the back end. And I'm just wondering, you know, it's already May, the IGF's in October, it's early this year. Have you guys calibrated out a, a game plan for deliverables and what uh, you know what your what this group is going to try to achieve in by what time slices, et cetera, et cetera? Because I haven't kind of gotten the sense of that yet. So if you could just give me some um, more sense of the way forward with IGF as a deliver, delivery point, that'd be that'd be helpful. Um, to know. Thanks. Um, so no, we don't have um, a date uh, for for the um, for those different milestones to be achieved or those milestones written down necessarily, Bill. But if others think that would be helpful, um, then we can we can do that. 
Uh, what we do have is the um, other discussions framed around the two other topics or buckets, but to the same questions, same three questions we'll be asking there. And then we want to be able to tease out responses to those questions um, that clarify what that type of fragmentation is, what it means, the intersections with the other types and recommendations for addressing them. So that would be brought together collectively um, an output uh, of this policy network, but we don't have the specific milestones in place. So we can do some thinking around how to get us to that point um, and uh, share that with you, with you all, but anyone with ideas or yeah, ideas for how to do that, please do get in touch. Finally, I just wanted to um, share with you that there is a rights concession that um, policy network and, and thank you for sharing the UT Zero event. Please do keep, keep us updated on that. Um, uh, RightsCon is, is a bit sooner. Um, it's just a few weeks away and um, the policy network will be um, working uh, with, with colleagues who are actually here from, from the UK government um, who, uh, uh, on a session, um, which we can share the details um, of. I don't have them at hand, but we will email them around to the mailing list. So please do join us um, if you're in Costa Rica, a wonderful, um, if not, it's it's online. So please do, uh, please do join us for that session online where we will be discussing um, the policy network. Um, we we're discussing the issues of, of fragmentation that we've been discussing today, but also the other areas, of the framework. So um, with that, um, I will uh, leave you to enjoy the rest of your day, uh, evening, afternoon. Thanks so much for joining us. Thanks so much for the speakers and their briefings. And to you all, um, we, will, we will be following up. So stay tuned. All right.